Last week I spoke about uh, a holy, a holy people, and and today I want to speak about a wise builder. Now, I come from the building industry. I, I for those that don't know, I'm actually a qualified plumber. Did that for 20 years of my life, and I can tell you, there's nothing as frustrating as a stupid builder. There's no stupid plumbers, just by the way. But I mean. <laughs> This, yeah, okay, Dion, Dion disagrees with me. <laughs> but you know, if, if, if you, if you have, uh, have a builder that's building your house, nah, and that builder, by the way, we, we, when Lorette's parents built their little granny fat, flat next to us, now, uh, I'm a plumber, so I've, I get involved in the building at a certain, certain point. But when we built that, um, Benny was still here, and he helped us with the building, and what what struck me is when we, we started with a foundation, you know, for me is, you know, draw a few lines on the ground, you know, with a tape measure and you, you get that going and you dig the hole and the truck comes with the concrete and they dump it in there and, and you know, and then we build. But it's not that simple because Benny spent literally hours measuring and marking not just the fact that the, the lines, would, but the thing is squared and I, tell, I wish I can quickly download to you the process that he went through to make sure that once that building is built that it will stand square on those foundations. And when you have a wise building, I tell you, we built that place and they stand my brother. It is rock solid. He's standing there. My parents are staying lacquer. They are having... He built it so well we can't get rid of the fog. It's just... Five years later, and they're still moist in the, in, the, in the building because he built it so well. But in any case, but a wise builder will make, uh, will build something that will last for many, many, many years. What happens when we have an, uh, uh, I don't want to say stupid builder, but what happens if you have an unwise builder? Like, like what I would have done. You know, I would have taken a tape measure, you know, it's 4.5 meters that way, it's 10 meters that way, you know, it should be, the, the trench should be 50 mil wide, you know, mark it out through a bit of sand, start digging, having fun, and by the time they're done, my square is out. And then the roof doesn't fit. You know, and your basin doesn't fit, and your bath is, you know, once they put the bath in that corner, the corner is not a corner. And then you go, then you want to blame the tiler. And the tiler go, no, but it was the builder. Who, who have you, uh, see, I see, you've been there, you've done that. No. Where, where, I've, I've walked into homes and I go like, did this guy even have a measuring tape? <laughs> I mean, really? Any case, so we, we want to be wise builders. And, you know, I think sometimes when we think of our, our walk with Jesus, when we, when we think of, um, maybe when we, we become Christians, we kind of just want to wing it. But I think Paul makes it very clear that, that we actually need to be wise in how we're going about this process. The fact of the matter is, when you get born again, the last thing that you are is wise. When you get born again, you need those that are wise to measure out your life for you. We talk about discipleship, we talk about accountability. And these things, and you know, in our day and age, many people frown about upon these things, but I tell you, we need that. I need people to sometimes just put that square against my life and say, oh, you're still lining up with the word of God, buddy. That plumb line. I have elders that go with that plumb line, this imaginary plumb line hanging here, and he goes, are you okay? How are you measuring up with the word of God? Are you preaching the word of God? Is what is coming out of this mouth God's word? Oh, okay, now it's very quiet in this place. It's very quiet in this place. So, 1 Corinthians 1, and you, this is not on the PowerPoint. I just want to read you the scripture. Paul kicks off Corinthians, and I'll get into what he says here now, but he says in verse 10, if you want to quickly go there on your phone or your iPad, I'm so sorry if you have one of those, but um, yeah, I'm just joking. Or whatever you have, just want to go to 1 Corinthians um, 1 and meet me in verse 10. I'm reading from the Amplified Version this morning because it just puts it so beautifully. It says, but I urge you, believers. So who is he speaking to? 
those, those that are, have set their faith in Jesus Christ. So in this case, he's speaking to us, right? That are believing in Jesus Christ. By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you be in full agreement in what you say. You see, when I come to Christ, a lot of us want to focus just on my life. But I tell you, this community, this family that God adds you into this morning, we've received new members. This matters. And Paul is speaking here to the church of the Corinthians and he's saying, listen, I, the first thing I want to say to you, you need to be in full agreement with what you say. In other words, you need to agree on what you believe. Okay, let's read on. And, uh, and that there be no divisions or factions among you, but that you <clears throat> be perfectly united in your way of thinking and in your judgment about matters of the faith. And that is why when we, when we take in new members, for instance, we sit with them and we talk about our statement of faith. Because we want to agree, we want to talk from one voice. We want to say the same thing. We want to believe the same thing. When it comes to matter of faith, if there's a whole pulling this way and that way here, how much success will we have out there? You know, if the, if the people then look at, at, at this church and, you know, we have this arguments and tension here and things are going rough, then, then what do they think? You know, what's going on here? And Paul is saying to them, listen, guys, there's some stuff happening in your church right now. And you, please, need to make sure that you are speaking and living in this way, that you are moving as one. We are a holy people, right? A set-apart people. It's like marriage. Married people, you can tell me now if I'm a liar. But in my short number of years married to this awesome woman, I, I've seen the devil come in with little small things. Small stuff, man. Small stuff. For some of you, it's the toilet's lid. And all the women went... Yeah, or well, the toilet paper is the wrong way around. It should roll off like that, but you're rolling it off like that. Not, okay, none of you have these off. Okay, I'm just saying. Uh, okay, I'm just, you know. <laughs> but, but it's those little things that causes division. And I think what Paul is saying here is that we need to be aware of the, the enemy and how he wants to come in and sow divisions. Now, in this case... He was speaking to them because in verse 12, I think, whoops, what happened here now? Verse 12, yes, he says, uh, now I mean this, that each of you, uh, each one of you says, I am a disciple of Paul, I am a disciple of Apollos, I am a disciple of Cephas, or I am a disciple of Christ. So there was division in their midst about who are they a disciple of? Who is speaking into their lives? And they're going, but my master is better than yours. Paul is better than Sephar. Sorry, guys. I mean, come on. You, he just doesn't make it. And they, uh, uh, a simple thing like walking with someone, discipleship became a tool in the enemy's hand to sow division among them. And Paul sees this. And if you read the whole book of, well, Corinthians, the first couple of chapters, you'll see how he is addressing this thing, this matter in the midst, to, to actually come to a place of being one. And moving as one. We know 1 Corinthians 13 is in there, right? That chapter, if you read 1 Corinthians 13 slow, because we sometimes want to read it fast, but you need to read it slow. Because if you read it slow, some of the words need to sink into your heart, which determines how we react to one another even. Through love. So, in chapter 2, 3, and 4, he addresses a few things. And, and in chapter 2, leading into to, to chapter 3, he speaks about three different people. And, and I just want to focus on, on that this morning. And in our journey with Jesus Christ, I think we must constantly discern which one of these three we are. Because the devil comes in with small stuff distracts me in a small 
manner. So he's refer referring in this, this text to the natural person, the spiritual person, or the unspiritual person or carnal person. That's the, the, uh, the carnal or unspiritual. They, they're the same person. So let's read that 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14, from verse 14 until 3 verse 1. It says, but the natural, now it describes what the natural person is here. It says, the natural, non-spiritual man does not accept, welcome, admit into his heart the gifts and teachings and revelations of the Spirit of God. This is the Amplified, if you didn't figure that out by now. For they are folly, meaningless, nonsense to him. So in other words, spiritual things to this guy makes no sense. He looks at it, he hears it, and to him it's meaningless. Okay? And he is incapable of knowing them, of progressively recognizing, understanding, and becoming better acquainted with him, because they are spiritually discerned and estimated and appreciated. So the first person he's speaking about here, when it comes to spiritual stuff, he, 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 he gets it like, huh? That the lights are on, but no one's home? Kind of look. I know some of you feel like that on a Monday. But, but he has this, when, when you speak to them about spiritual things, it's like they, they don't understand. I must just say, but it doesn't mean that when we speak the word of God, the truth into their lives, that it doesn't go behind that veil, Right? The word of God, the truth of God will go through that. But generally, verse 15, but the spiritual man tries all things. When I read that, I thought, wow, okay? Tries all things. He examines, investigates, inquires into, questions, and discerns all things. Yet, he himself uh, uh, to be put on trial and judged by no one. But yet, he is himself to be put on uh, uh, to be put on trial and judged by no one. He can read the meaning of everything, but no one can properly discern and appraise or get an insight into him. So, so what's happening here, when a natu uh, the natural person looks at the spiritual person, they can't figure out what's going on here. He is moving and seeing things and understanding things, and he, this person cannot judge what's going on in his life. For he, has, for he has known and understood the mind of the Lord so as to guide and instruct him and give him knowledge. But we have the mind of Christ and do hold the thoughts of his heart. Now that last sentence should bless you. Well, the last couple of sentences. Okay? Because we are supposed to know and understand the mind of the Lord. That that will guide and instruct us and give us knowledge. We often say we have the mind of Christ. But when we know and understand him. You know when it comes to that first. first there's an inquisitiveness here. But I'll get into that just now. And then 3 verse 1. And then he goes however. Brethren. I could not talk to you. As a spiritual man. But as non-spiritual. Men of the flesh. In whom the carnal nature predominates. As to mere infants in the new life in Christ. Unable to talk yet. Do you hear his tension here? Do you hear him saying or seeing what he's looking at this congregation. And his, his three, he, he instructs him and these three people. And go like, but, but I cannot speak to you as a spiritual man. So the three people. I've got three buckets. The natural man, the spiritual man, the carnal man. Okay? Let me just grab my notes here. Okay? The natural man, if that is you, you do not accept the teachings and the revelations of the spirit. You reject them. Okay? They do not have the Spirit of God and are not able to understand the things of the Lord. In other words, this guy has not come to the place where he surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. Okay? And we recognize there are those on this earth that are, that are there. These are the ones that we know just as God loved us, He still loves them and He wants to save them. 
It is our purpose to minister to them. Then he's got the spiritual man. Okay? And you have to read this in the Amplified. I love it, obviously, in the Amplified here. Because he says, he examines, investigates, inquires into, questions, and discerns all things. I mean, come on. Don't you, can you see that this spiritual person doesn't have a screensaver on? Do you know what a screensaver is? It's the same thing as when the lights are on and no one's known. No, it's like... There's inquisitiveness. There's a wanting to learn. There's a, there's a Lord, teach me more. Lord, what, what is this? What is that, Lord? You know, I heard him say that. Father, what is that? I want to know more, God, and please teach me. These things, there's this, there's this longing to grow as the deer pants for the water. This is that person. He wants more of God. He's just, he, he just spiritually hungry, man. He has known and understood the mind of the Lord. So to guide him and instruct him and give him, give him knowledge. So when I'm inquisitive, when, I, when I'm interested, when I, when I investigate these things, when I'm in God's word... I get to know his heart. And when I get to know his heart, it instructs my step. I have wisdom. I have understanding way beyond my years. I'm able to move into places and, and go do things which otherwise I won't be able to do because I am a spiritual man. Romans 8 says, you know, we go read Romans 8. Probably one of my favorite, most challenging chapters in the Bible. Walk by the Spirit. And he doesn't say that it's only uh, limited to uh, five hours a day. S Stephen, you're driving somewhere. <laughs> and then he comes to the carnal man. Now the carnal man... They are spiritual people who are living as natural people. In other words, they've got, they're trying to have their legs in both worlds. So in other words, when they must be spiritual, they are very spiritual. But when they walk away from that, they are not. Okay? Or the carnal man. I'm now in the spiritual man. By the way, I got confused with my own buckets here. <laughs> okay, but it's a good example because this carnal man is confused. Now, is he spiritual or is he carnal? You know, when should he be spiritual and when should he be carnal? And, and he's, he's not spiritual, but he wants to be spiritual, but he's not because he's carnal. Because he's allowing his own ideas and thoughts and opinions of man to shape his life. And then when needed, he goes like, Jesus, help. So he's bouncing between two worlds. So it's important when it comes to our discipleship, when it comes to Matthew 2, 28, we are having fun here this morning. I mean, come on, buckets and thorns flying around. It's, it's good stuff. But it's very important when it comes to Matthew 28, when it comes to going and making disciples, when it comes to obedience to God, I think it's important for us to understand which bucket are we talking about here. Which life. See, when I reach out to someone, you know, if they are spiritual, my spirit will link with them quickly. If they are carnal, I can go, okay, so how can we disciple and help you? But if, if they are the natural man, if they are just living in their sin, man, come on. I think the most difficult people sometimes are those that are bouncing between these two. Because you give them biblical truth, but then they, they judge it through a carnal mind. Not a biblical mind. They reason it out. Instead of praying it through. They walk by their flesh. They don't walk by their spirit. When we are called... To walk by the Spirit. And I tell you, when I think about our holy people, when I think about the church of Jesus Christ, when I think about being an almond bearer, I cannot bounce about between these two. 
If the church of Jesus Christ is going to continually bounce between these two, if we're going to try and live a spiritual life from a carnal point of view, we will not overcome. We will not be a victorious church because we are double-minded. And Paul writes about that, right? A double-minded will receive nothing. Because we know what a double-minded man does. He prays about something and then he tries to fix it himself. I've done that. Pray, pray, pray. Here, help. Here, money, worry me. I've got this. I've got the plan. I need finances, Lord. Don't worry, Lord. I sold my, sold my grandma. I got money. Bad example. And Paul says, I could not address you as spiritual people because you are carnally minded. What a dangerous place to be in. You know, and it's for each one of us to judge. Where am I? What life am I living? Am I bouncing between spiritual and carnal? Am I really walking by the Spirit of God? Is my life sold out 100% to Him? Or am I still compromising? Trying to figure out, can or can I not do this? You know, when it comes to the Spirit, just want to say this. In our flesh, probably the biggest challenge and frustration we all face is the waiting on the Lord part. You see, because when, when I walk by the Spirit and I say, Jesus, I need finances. You know what's the one thing I have to do? Wait. Because until He provides the finances, I have to wait. Unless He says to me, Kubis, what's in your hand? Unless He wants to lead me into doing something which He will bless, that will pro make provision. Saints, and I, I don't know about you, but, but I'm concerned for the church as to where we're at. Because life can be very interesting. In discipleship, you will find it very difficult to teach someone and even sometimes yourself, biblical truth, if that person is more interested, about, interested on their own opinion or the other's opinions or the popular opinion. It's one of the things that I've seen in ministry, well, not just ministry, but, but in my walk with Christ, is you can sit with someone, you can give them biblical truth, you can give them counseling straight from the Word and the Spirit of God, and then they still make a choice. Whether they want to run with it, they want to apply it, or whether they're going to fix it themselves. And I think it's important that we get to a place where we single-mindedly focus on what the Spirit of God wants to say to us. You know, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18 says, the word of, uh, of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. The natural man. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So we can see in the scripture that Paul's concern is the fact that the church, all know, uh, knowing Jesus, were unable to digest spiritual matters, even though they should have been able to do so. Why were they not, be, why was he not able to give them steak? Because this church, in their carnality, because they were fighting be, between one another, they were allowing those divisions and factions to come in, were bouncing between the carnal and the spiritual. Therefore, they are unable, and I'm sure there was some other stuff going on there, but, but that is why, you know, there was, he couldn't give them the steak. And you can read his frustration there. They allowed the flesh to hinder their growth. 
And therefore they responded in childish manner to spiritual truth. And like I've said, I think the most important thing for us to realize or to know is that of these three people, the most dangerous one to be in is the carnal state. As believers in Jesus Christ, we need to continually guard these things. That is why we need spiritual family. That, that is why this Christian walk is not on my own, because Paul can see something in my life that I can't see. We all have blind spots, right? Sometimes we, we just harakwas. Sometimes I can justify why I'm doing it. But if I've got a brother who loves me that can go quivers, can, can we talk about what I see? He loves me enough, so it's not like he wants to bully me or hurt me, but he loves me enough to come gently speak God's truth into my life. I need that. And when I do that, and he comes and he speaks to me, provided that I receive it, when I do receive it, change will come. See, God just doesn't use pastors. He actually uses those around us to speak into our lives. Revelation 3 verse 15 to 18 Jesus confirms this. He said, I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold, with that you uh, were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Ouch. That's the carnal man. He says, for you say, I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, purple, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and solve so that to anoint your eyes to see. So, so that you may see. So there's this invitation of Jesus Christ to move from the carnal man to the spiritual man. To stay anchored. To be a wise builder. To make sure that my foundation and everything is correct. See, Paul, when it comes to the wild, wise builder, he says, listen, I've laid the foundation. Apollos watered it. I sowed the seed. Apollos watered it, but it's God that brings the growth. I want to say to you, don't despise the people that God has used in your life to sow the seed. Those that watered the seed. I guess the question is, what about the growth? Are you allowing God to bring the growth in your life? Or are you fine being carnally minded? Jumping between two opinions. Trying to walk by the Spirit, but you're actually walking in your flesh. And then justifying that. Now, when you encounter people in discipleship, you will encounter these things. What's sad is that Paul is addressing the church of Jesus Christ. And this is in you. That's why I want to read to you again verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 3. It says, and I didn't read this, but I'll read to you now. I fed you with milk not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Even, even now you are not ready, for you are still in the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not in, uh, of the flesh or by behaving only in a human way? We need to discern where we are at. I can take responsibilities for my actions and for the way I walk before the God. And I mean to make sure that I'm planted in Him more than ever. To add to this, I just want to quickly, as I close, though many people really dedicate themselves to the purposes of God in their lives. 
possibly because they are either choosing to be the natural man or they're falling between two opinions. They become jack of all trades, masters of none, rather of jack of few tra trades focused on one. So they're running around. And maybe to help us make this decision this morning, and for you to reach your full potential in Jesus Christ, I want to give you four points that you can maybe help you. This first one is that, focus on the main goal. Keep the main thing the main thing. In this case, keep the main person the main person. But you want to reach the goal that God is calling you to. You want to reach your full potential in Jesus Christ. But I want to say to you, it's not going to happen fully while you're doing this. While you're jumping between your flesh and your spirit. If I read scripture, I have died with Christ, right? So this is where I should be. But it so easily happens that I'm being drawn into my flesh again. So if you want to be a wise builder, focus on the main goal. Nobody ever reached their full potential by being scattered between 20 things. Don't try and be everything to everybody. Be who Christ has called you to be. Fulfill that purpose. Because the truth is, one day you're going to stand before him about that. And maybe he's spoken to you. And maybe you're disobedient in doing what he wants you to do. Maybe you should really play the drums here. And you're not listening or do the sound. You, you know how spiritual that is. In any case, let me not go down there. Concentrate on continual improvement and growth. Each day you can become a little better than the previous day. If only you position yourself in such a way that you can grow. So if you are finding that you are here, then position you, yourself to grow in the word, to grow in prayer, to grow in Bible reading, to grow so that you can be better than what you were yesterday. Yeah, but I'm stuck with us. No, that's a cheap excuse. You're probably stuck there because you're not willing to make the decision to be a spirit man. I'm going to be sold out. I'm giving everything, 100%. And then forget the past. Rid yourself of the natural and the carnal man. Get, get it out of the picture. The devil will use your past to, to keep you there. You're not good enough. You're stupid. I don't know what the devil tells you. Jack Eifert said, we can't gain any momentum moving forward to tomorrow if we are dragging the past behind us. And then the last one, focus on the future. Become better than you were. Be become better tomorrow than you are today. Walk in that spirit, man. See, the church here is the place where we should move from in in infancy to adulthood. The sad thing is people can sit here, year on year on year, and not much changes. Because in my experience, you will only grow as much as you position yourself to grow. You will only grow as much as you are willing to let go of your own way. And you allow the Spirit of God to lead you. We want you to reach the place where you are a spiritual man, a mature spiritual man or woman. Okay? We want to be a people who can rightly divide the word of God. A people who declare the excellencies of God. A people walking in his marvelous light. So I want to say to you, if you are a spiritual man, a woman here today, I want to encourage you to never stop growing, to never stop hungering, to never stop pursuing God, to let the light that the fire that God lit in your life so many years ago, to let that burn 
even in greater measure. You know this world, this community needs it. We need it. We, the, 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 the harvest is ready and we need to co-labor with God to bring in that harvest. But if there's divisions and factions and stuff between us, then we won't be able to actually get there. Grow every day to become, become better than yesterday. Reach your full potential and purpose in God. That is my prayer for us.